Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Regional Chamber's Restart Michigan webinar with our friends from Miller Canfield. We know that all of businesses across the state are anxious to get real, credible, and timely information regarding how they can restart their businesses safely, how they can restart their businesses in the most efficient way, and how they can restart their businesses to position themselves for future economic success in a very uncertain environment. Today, to help us guide us through some of those very tricky questions, from Miller Canfield, we have Brad Arbuckle. You know, Brad, I'm gonna let you wave so people know where you are on the, on the screen, for those of you who are joining us by, by video. And then Richard Wallowender, also from Miller Canfield. Richard, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. So, our time together is going to be spent on uh, talking about these issues uh, that, that are confronting businesses. As the Detroit Regional Chamber practice has been, uh, we would love to hear questions from, from you in your chat box, which is probably on the right-hand side of your screen. If you go down to the line item that says questions, you can pop that box out and you can, uh, you can type in a question. Brad Williams, who serves as the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Chamber, is also on this line, and he's going to be monitoring that question box. As we reach the end of our time together, uh, with about the last 15 minutes or so, Brad will take questions from that chat box and direct them to Brad or Richard as appropriate. Also, I want to draw your attention to the lower right-hand corner of your uh, of your uh, software box where it says handouts and if you click on that you will see a pdf document named checklist for resuming business that is a document from our friends at miller canfield and it is yours to review throughout the session and of course for you to download and refer to later so with the administration out of the way let me first turn it over to brad arbuckle of miller canfield for some opening remarks brad uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, you know, when we go through our checklist, it's at somewhat of a high level, but it'll give you, a, you know, the goal is to give you a good heads up on what to look for. A lot of these are the questions that we're getting from our clients and what they're looking for. And it really comes down to is, in some cases, how practical is it to actually reopen given where we're at today? I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Rick. Yeah, let me let me just uh, uh, follow up on what Sandy said. Uh, we, we're not going to address two other very important issues, though. Um, there's other webinars that the chamber's been putting on about that. One is all the employment issues, uh, workforce issues, and then related to that, sort of the the health and safety OSHA issues. So we're not covering that. What we're going to be focusing on today is discussing you know how your your company is uh able and should be thinking about starting resuming operations restarting operations vis-a-vis uh, -vis other companies whether they're your your you know third parties or suppliers or lenders or uh customers because as you can as you know not everybody in the entire world is starting the same time there's going to be a lot of disparities between, you know, even companies within the same state, let alone cross border. And so you have a myriad of issues that that is presenting, uh, which we'll talk about. Okay, great. Uh, and the other uh, disclaimer I'm going to make is that our friends from Miller Canfield uh, have chosen to wear ties today with their beards. Uh, those of us at the chamber, uh, we haven't seen a tie in a while. So you guys are gonna look a lot better than, than uh, Brad Williams or myself. So let's start at the beginning. A company has been given uh, the government approval to, uh, to open up. Uh, how does a company, uh, what should the company be doing and thinking about in terms of notifying, uh, you know, notifying their customers, notifying their supply base, what is the process that a company needs to go through? Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll start with that one, Sandy. So, what we've been uh, advising our clients is to put this into a larger context. Again, is, is following up on what I said earlier, not everybody is starting at the same time or at the same level playing field. 
and a lot of businesses out there have either received or given notices of force majeure as to that they're suspending operations and uh, and and notifying their their customers as to when they uh, how things are going and and then typically in a force majeure clause and and I would start there. Pay attention to that because uh, typical force majeure clause, and again, force majeure is very contractually oriented. There's there's a little bit of a, uh, a you know miscommunication out there as to what force majeure is. There's no sort of general law providing companies with the right to declare force majeure and do uh, uh, suspend operations. It's really a function of what is in your contract. And so, and there's exceptions to that. The Uniform Commercial Code has a an analogous type of provision, which, which does allow for that. But a lot of businesses out there have contracts, and so you need to focus on what your contract says. And so when you originally, in a force majeure clause, they typically, again, even though you got to pay very close attention to each clause, you know, they, they, they have some common themes. One of the common themes is that um, you know you need to notify your your customer, the other party to the contract, as to uh, when that force majeure event, when the suspension of operations are projected to uh, uh, be over with, and when you can uh, it can resume operations. And so that's the point. Let's say you're at right now. You're ready to begin operations. You should you should be telling your clients, informing them in writing, um, not only that you're when you're expected to begin operations, but also hedge it, you know, into the uh, to the extent that it might not go as smoothly as you anticipate. So you need to explain what the possible uh, <clears throat> problems in in resuming operations might be. And then and then, as we'll talk about later on, anticipate some of the issues that might arise with your other uh, uh, party in the contract. And that is that that uh, uh, you might not be able to resume 100% because of employees, because of you know uh, social distancing requirements imposed on your business, because you just can't you know turn turn the lights on and, and begin production in a hundred days. So the best policy really, and, and the is a practical one to, to anticipate these issues, to work it out with your clients uh, and customers and suppliers in advance to try to, as I said, anticipate those problems and to avoid having to um, trip over yourself and then possibly be in a breach of contract. In a, in a force majeure clause, you you have a a right a lot of times to suspend operations, but you got to follow what that clause says. And one of the provisions, uh, a very typical provision in a force majeure clause, is that the other side, if you're not following that clause and are in breach of that clause, they can. Uh, a lot of times, they have a right and the ability uh, under the contract to terminate your contract because you haven't followed the simple instructions of the force majeure clause. So the, the sort of the bottom line is anticipate these issues, outline them, keep your other parties to the contract informed of what's going on and what your plans are. Now, force majeure has popped up a lot, obviously, and, and thank you for uh, getting into that. Uh, does a contract need to have a force majeure clause in it in order for a company to start exercising or exploring exercising that option or is force majeure something that is implied in any contract no it is it is not it's not implied in well it, it, it two there's there's three ways the law provides you from an excuse to perform it's, without, ways. It, it's never easy no, no, it's not. Force majeure is is what is in the contract, and okay. and it is very contractually driven. And that's what I said. You you got to look at your contracts and to see and follow the procedure. If you have sort of a general purchase order that doesn't have any kind of terms and conditions or force majeure clauses attached to it, and that contract is for the sale of goods, 
then yes, Sandy, the, the Uniform Commercial Code, which is in effect in Michigan and all the states, um, does provide for, call it a, a, a type of force majeure called commercial impracticability. And again, you have a duty to mitigate any kind of losses, any kind of uh, um, uh, problems that, that present itself with the operation. If you have a contract that is not for the sale of goods, then the third way is the common law provides sort of a, uh, uh, a right to excuse operation by virtue of it becoming impossible for you to perform. But again, those words are very loaded with legal uh, background, all of them. So you have to you have to be careful how you're doing it, and again, you know, anticipate the issues up front. Great, Brad. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would say the, the real key with all this is is to Rick's point is you really need to communicate with people in the supply chain, both um, below you and above you, because the timing is going to be different. The contracts, um, in theory, should flow through, but they could be different. So what you really want to do is talk to the folks and make certain that you're uh, avoiding surprises. Because what they don't want to have happen is, I'm going to start up, but the guy below me can't supply me. So all of a sudden, I'm shutting the guy down who's above me. You really, you really need to have the sequenced well. And so, you know, you do want to look at the contract and make sure you understand what's in it and what you can do, but just from a practical standpoint, you really want to be talking to your customers and to your suppliers to make certain that you're all on the same page so that you're not um, over-promising and under-delivering. So let's look ahead a little bit. So let's say that you know uh, the company in question has been able to uh, start up in a sufficient way. They're, they're fulfilling their contract with, uh, uh, with, with their customer, and there's another spike in cases. Uh, you know, that uh, that might be uh, uh, a situation where the government has said shut down, or it might be specific to your region or your plant uh, or your facility. Uh, what are the kinds of things that businesses need to be thinking about if they get started and all of a sudden there's another spike in cases? You want to go, Rick, or do you want to go ahead? Yes, yeah, so for that, again, that, that's one reason why you want to look at your contract. Because um, if it's if it's a, a a government order that applies to you and other folks in your region region, that's probably the easier way to claim force majeure because the government shut me down. If it is unique to you and otherwise uh, the economy is going and folks are able to operate or ramp up, you're going to want to know what the force majeure clause in your contract says because now you're going to say um, within the terms that we agreed upon. I'm entitled to shut down or I'm entitled to uh, cut back on it. And that necessarily won't be a breach. The other side will um, need to think about it. Now, if you're on the other side where you're running, you're not the one experiencing the spike, you know, one of the things you're going to want to do is look at, do I have alternative customers, alternative suppliers in, a, in the event that something like that happens so that I can cover, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be in a position where I get shut down because somebody below me is having a spike in claims force majeure. I may need to find alternatives because in one sense, I am capable of performing my contract. And so that'll be the expectation. And, 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 and I would add, even if that means, uh, and this is where it gets legally dicey for a lot of uh, businesses, because you have that duty implied or expressed in your contract or implied by law that you need to mitigate any potential damages. So as Brad said, if you if that means you have to go find materials from an alternative supplier, even if it might cost you some more, you need to address that issue. Great, great counsel. All right, so let's uh, let, let, let's let, let's move to money. So uh, what does a business do if they are concerned that they are not going to be in compliance with the uh, financial covenants uh, that are in their loan loan agreements? Yeah, so the first thing to do that we've advised a lot of our clients is actually take the time to read the loan agreements. And the reason for that is uh, sometimes there are things that will give you um, some grace periods, uh, but there are other things that can sort of be surprises to you. So we've had a number of clients who, when this started, wanted to draw down on their uh, revolving lines of credit that they had. And um, typically when you do that, you need to make a number of certifications, one of which is no material adverse event has occurred. So at the start of this, you could probably make that certification and draw down the money. 
now you're at a point where what's it going to look like going forward? So one of the things is how big is the impact? How long is it going to last? Um, what does the definition of material adverse effects say? Because it may, you know, one of the questions you're going to want to think about is, is it a uh, historical event, meaning looking back, nothing's happened, or does it also apply to what are your prospects going forward? Because now you're going to have to do an analysis to say, will I be in good shape if I draw this money down, you know, going forward? The other thing is just to look at what do, what is the material adverse effect. Um, how, how broad is it? Is it just generally, you know, catastrophic things have happened or is it limited to, for example, is this a material adverse effect on your ability to repay the loan, which is a narrower concept? So you want to look at that. And then the other thing you have to start looking at is what is your borrowing base? So, for example, in a lot of scenarios, your borrowing base is based on your accounts receivable. Everybody's shutting down. You probably haven't been producing a lot. So your accounts receivable probably are not fresh. And the ones that you have, now you've got to look at it and say, even though they're older, are they still collectible? So then that starts getting into what's your definition of borrowing base? And there are things there that, um, you know, again, you need to understand what the reps and warranties that you've made are and what the conditions are to drawing because uh, simply needing the cash may not be sufficient. So, you know, you ought, you ought to look at your loan documents, see what you can do. The other thing you need to do is, you know, there's other ways to uh, enhance your liquidity. So one of it is to um, minimize prepayments. If you can, you may want, you could maybe sell assets. You might want to reduce or delay expenditures like CapEx or like, like there's folks doing that. Um, the other thing to do is to look for alternative forms of financing. So recently, we've had a number of clients who did the Paycheck Protection Loan uh, Program loans. And there's another one out there that the Federal Reserve is starting to ramp up that's called the Main Street um, Lending Program. And all of these are designed to get um, money into companies. So the Paycheck Protection was designed to, um, you're expected to spend that on employment and the like. The Main Street Lending facilities are more like traditional loans. The amounts you can get are somewhat larger. Uh, minimal size starts at about 500,000, but if you go under the one program, could be up to 200 million. Those you're going to want to talk to your bankers about now because Main Street lending is a Federal Reserve program, but the Fed is not the entity making the loan. It is your local bank. So you ought to be talking to your existing uh, bank creditors now to see what's the expectation in terms of your existing credit and then what is their availability to participate in the uh, Main Street lending program. And I would just uh, remind our, our viewers and listeners today that there is still Paycheck Protection Program money out there. The first tranche went very, very quickly, uh, but apparently there's still uh, 25, 35 percent um, still uh, unallocated. So there are still avenues available through the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, let's move to contracts. Uh, what kind of contract claims and issues might a business have uh, with their customers and suppliers? And I'll address that. So this is probably the hardest thing to get a, a client to pay attention to because, uh, you know, they don't like digging into the weeds in terms of finding out there's things in their contracts that they probably shouldn't have agreed to or wouldn't have agreed to. And a lot of contracts, frankly, are boilerplate, you know, and people didn't uh, didn't pay attention to it. And one example we already talked about is force majeure clauses. Um there's still debate about whether a uh, you know a, a virus pandemic like like we're experiencing now is is covered under the the, the term act of God or unforeseen or or, or whatever. But uh, but but the the probably the biggest uh, uh, issue that I point out in terms of contracts and there are a lot of them. But a big issue that Brad alluded to is is payment. There, everybody ha is going to have liquidity issues, and your contracts, most of them, provide for terms of payment. And so, if you're looking to get paid by a customer, or likewise looking to uh, needed to pay a supplier, you usually have a certain amount of time to pay that uh, the payment terms. And because of 
because of liquidity problems, you know, naturally businesses are going to try to string that along as long as possible. Um, and here's the issue with that. The issue is, you know, it's not just the problem of, of uh, uh, cash flow. It's a problem of potentially never getting your money. Because if that customer then files for bankruptcy, let's say, you, you have a real difficult time collecting even pennies on the dollar on that. And so uh, one other, I will just mention one other thing that we're seeing uh, uh, quite a bit of that's pretty popular in Europe and in some parts of uh, Asia, companies doing work there, that, that I think you'll see a rise in interest is factoring. Um, and that is the ability to sell your accounts receivable um, in advance. You know, a lot of automotive suppliers are able to, you know, participate in programs like like this in factoring. You sell your receivables in advance for a – you take a haircut, but at least you have the money. And you have that, you know, very quickly. But look at the payment provisions. Look at the delivery provisions in your contracts. You're going to be – uh, in terms of your volume of commitments, let's say you have you're a supplier to uh, a customer that you know issues you releases and purchase orders requiring a certain amount of parts to be delivered, you know, within two weeks or within X amount of days after that getting that release or that order. Uh, your contract probably says you need to do that, otherwise you can be in breach. So again, anticipating. All the problems up and down the supply chain, as well as at your facility and your production capabilities, the time to deal with that and try to amend that and modify that is now. And those are just sort of the obvious examples. And there's a lot of contracts that provide for, as I said, a lot of times boilerplate provisions or uh, another one on exclusivity. Brad mentioned earlier that, you know, you might need to anticipate if your supplier is not yet open the ability to uh, purchase from from another supplier, but watch it. Your contract with that supplier might prohibit you from doing that uh, because it requires exclusivity. So those kinds of things, besides the other reps and warranties that you have in your contract as to your solvency position or whether whether there's uh, any kind of material adverse uh, change that you're undergoing, um, are, are very important things. So in a nutshell, you, you know, I hate to say it like this because it's only lawyers that end up doing this, but you need to look at really almost all of your contracts to see what is, what is putting you in breach potentially and what is uh, putting your, your uh, um, uh, suppliers uh, and customers in breach and do either enforce your rights or address those issues before they become uh, entangled in court. The other thing you need to do when you review your contracts is think of those contracts in the context of other contracts. So you need to look for things like cross default provisions. So for example, you could have, an, uh, say you have a material contract with the supplier, supplier defaults, you're not in breach, but if you have to make a rep and warranty in your financial statement that that supply contract's good, when they default, you're now breaching your reps and warranties to the bank. So you need to um, know what sort of the uh, cascading effects are when things happen and understand what, um, where they can have an impact. And then you also need to be prepared, again, we're back to what alternatives can I come up with so that um, I can remedy any sort of cost defaults that occur or um, get my creditors or other contract parties comfortable that uh, there won't be a hiccup as between me and them. Great. Thank you. And, you know, uh, uh, Richard, what you were saying about uh, 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 the factoring, yeah, I mean, we're hearing so much from, uh, from, from the businesses that we serve that, you know, their, their accounts receivable just keeps getting longer and longer. People are stretching out, stretching out those payments, so that becomes a much more attractive option. Uh, let's talk about uh, financial distress and bankruptcy. Uh, you know, if you're worried about your customer's financial situation, uh, what are some of the steps you should be thinking about? Well, with that, you need to be communicating with them to, you know, if they're starting to get slower pay, um, or if you're reading things in the paper as to, um, you know, what their likelihood for opening or continuing are, you need to start 
making some changes so you can change perhaps you know the payment terms on which you get it's cash on delivery or it's um looking for some backup like a letter of credit or a guarantee if they have a more significant parent company so that you've got some protection what you don't want to do is just keep shipping them because you can because there's going to be a 90 day assuming they're not insiders look back period and that gets into is it a preference and if they um fall way behind but then they pay you within the 90 days before they declare bankruptcy you can be asked to return that by the bankruptcy trustee so you really need to stay on top of what your customers and suppliers are doing and again looking at sort of how the payment flows are they consistent with what you've traditionally done or are they really starting to lag and and and, and, and uh, sandy if i could just follow up on that you know related to that there is a remedy that companies have or not a remedy, but a measure that they have available to them, whether it's not, whether or not it's in your contract, and usually it's not, but it's provided by the Uniform Commercial Code, and that is to send, if you are, if you have reasonable grounds to be insecure about a, a, another party's ability to perform under its contract, you have the right to, to send them what we call a demand for adequate assurance of performance. And a lot of businesses are going to be doing that because, as Brad said, even though your contract requires you to, you know, to deliver parts, to produce parts or components or uh, whatever goods, if you are, again, if you have reasonable grounds to be insecure about your, about that other party's ability to pay you or to perform, you could and you should send them a demand asking them asking them and, and requiring them rather to prove that they have the cash to, to pay you have the ability to perform and if they don't you have the right then to either terminate the contract or to suspend your own performance um, and and I think this is a tool that you're going to see a lot of uh, in in as businesses are opening up because they they don't want to be on the one hand uh, declared to have breached their performance, while on the other hand uh, um, worried that the other party is going to be able to perform. Um, uh, I'm going to remind our audience that uh, you, know, you have the ability to ask questions through the box on your right that says questions, uh, and also that there is a handout available uh, under the section that says handout. It's a PDF form. Uh, you may want to look at that, and which might prompt some questions as well too. Uh, Richard, I, I actually want to go back to this uh, to this issue that we've been talking about for a few minutes now about uh, if I'm a company and I'm concerned or I have demonstrated evidence that you know the company that's supplying me uh, is not able to for whatever reason. You just suggested that you send the demand letter, uh, but if my contract says, listen, I have to use that supplier exclusively, they're not supplying for whatever reason financial instability, maybe they're still under a, a stay-at-home order. Uh, how does a company then uh, properly go about looking for another supplier for that piece so my company can uh, can continue to produce? Well, I, I, and that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. It's actually, uh, uh, we have a couple clients undergoing that right now, that same kind of experience. It, it, it most of these exclusivity provisions will be um, you know will be uh, uh, tied in with this what I call adequate assurance of performance you don't have to perform if again the other side is not able to demonstrate and assure you that it's able to perform so if you have an exclusive uh, relationship with a supplier let's say and you are now uh, very concerned about their ability to keep supplying, you, you know, I would say before you breach or, or uh, um, delete or, or get rid of the exclusivity obligation, you need to follow through with evidence and assurances that they are able to perform. If they're not able to, again, if they're not able to assure you and provide that uh, uh, assurance that you are entitled to, then, as I said, that you're no longer obligated um, under your exclusivity arrangement with them to, to honor that. Here's a quick question, but we, we get it a lot uh, here at the chamber. I'm sure you're getting it as well too. Uh, business interruption insurance. 
Uh, what what role does business interruption insurance play in this crisis? Yeah, well, it 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 it, it depends uh, who you're asking. <laughs> Um, and our message is very, very simple, very clear. Um, everybody should be looking at their insurance policy. And you'll hear a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, rumors out there or, or arguments that a virus, by definition, cannot trigger a business interruption policy. And that is just not the case. What it is, again, very specific to the language of the policy, but let me just give you an example. So, and um, in, in, in even in Michigan, there are every, uh, these, by the way, business interruption coverage is provided most, almost all the time in a company's property uh, coverage policy. And so the property policy says, we will cover you for any physical loss or damage caused to your property. And so the argument on the other side is, well, you know, a virus can't cause damage, physical, actual damage to property. Therefore, it's not covered. And that is just not the case. It's not the case in, in a lot of states. And before all of this, before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were cases decided saying that things like, you know, bacteria or microorganisms caused it and 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 also things like smoke or fumes and there's even a case i think out of new jersey that said even the odor of cat urine is enough if it makes the premises uninhabitable that's enough to trigger physical damage coverage so you need to really look at your policy and even if it's not at your policy at your physical location you know a lot of these business interruption insurance policies also include things called civil or military authority uh, orders, which stay-at-home orders qualify as, and, um, and, and other things like if it's not even at your property, but what's called a dependent's property, either your supplier or your customer, they close up operations and therefore force you to, um, that can obviously trigger coverage. The one, the one thing also is in business interruption is that a lot of policies do contain a virus exclusion. And those are a little more uh, difficult to deal with uh, in terms of whether it triggers the policy. Again, it depends on the language. However, I would say, again, it, it might not cover, it might cover your premises, but it might not cover your customers or your suppliers. Um, um, it might not exclude you from that, I should say. So it's important to look at it now. And then finally, you, you don't have a lot of time to do this because your insurance, almost all insurance policies provide for a limited amount of time for you to file a claim. And uh, Richard, my understanding is that uh, if your uh, policy uh, contains just general language like acts of God, that uh, generally uh, something like a virus actually does not fall under the category of act of God. Is that correct? The, yeah, that, that's right, Sandy. The, 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 the way courts interpret insurance policies, frankly, are, um, are very much in favor. If there's an ambiguity, they're going to uh, uh, generally interpret it in favor of the insured, of the policyholder. So that's why even if you have an exclusion for what, what I mentioned earlier, things like bacteria, microorganisms, uh, microbes, or, or you know things like that, but it doesn't specifically mention virus, a lot of people will tell you it, if it doesn't mention virus, then virus is not excluded. Uh, let's talk about corporate uh, governance issues. Um, you know, what should... Um, what, what are some of your top recommendations that you have for businesses to protect themselves uh, and the actions that businesses need to take regarding corporate governance uh, in light of this pandemic? Right. So what we've been advising clients and what they've been doing is, is, is it, as you've heard a number of times, put things in writing, document everything. And it, it's, it, it varies depending on what it is you're doing. So for example, with the paycheck protection, program, you know, in essence, there's requirements that did you need the money? So we would have 
discussions at the board level to say, tell us why you need that money. And then we would describe those discussions within the resolution so that when they come back to audit, we can say at the time, here's what we thought, here's why we did it, here's why we needed it. We actually did the effort to do it. A lot of these things that we've described is you're going to be doing some analysis, you're going to be looking at things, you should document it. You know, for example, if you're going to make the insurance claim, what are the damages? How has it happened? What could it be? Because it may be, you know, they will say, oh, it's COVID, therefore it's a virus. But the answer may be, well, the virus really didn't impact me. It was the government order, and it was the fact that my uh, customer shut down. So could I make the claim? And it, what will happen will be as you go through and document, you'll get a better feeling for um, sort of what the issue is, but also what are ways that you can mitigate the, uh, the problems and the like. The other thing to do is to, because there will be litigation as we start opening up, when you do send out emails and documents, you need to really think about what it is you're saying and why. So take the time to put some um, thought into it. And then also, as you brought up at the start, you know, what happens if there's a subsequent spike? Really start thinking about what your contingency plans would be three months from now, four months from now. We're starting to open up, but it doesn't mean we couldn't be shut down again. And what would be your position then? Let me try to uh, weave a couple issues together and have you look forward. Uh, it seems to me that when we talk about force majeure and we talk about emergencies like, you know, like Governor Whitmer's authority to act in an emergency, we're used to an emergency kind of being a, a sudden event, uh, uh, an event that kind of has a beginning, middle and end, uh, like a hurricane. Uh, or maybe after 9-11. Uh, this emergency is going to last quite a long time. So my question is, how does the legal landscape change for a company the longer this COVID crisis goes on? Like, for example, does, does force majeure become less of a leg to stand on the longer this crisis goes on and can be easily anticipated that it will go on longer? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it does. And I think you, you, you know, hit the nail on the head, Sandy, um, by, by basically expressing what we are all uh, having to deal with all the time. And that is, it's not only a different landscape in terms of how we're going to be doing business, but it's the, the most of the contracts in place now. Are not, they don't address these things. Force majeure has always been thought of. Business interruption has always been thought of uh, as, as uh, you know, one-time events that eventually get over with. And that, that's why it, it's especially, I think, now important to, to anticipate how you should be thinking about this in light, of, in light of your now legal framework, contractual framework that you have. And, and the simple answer is, it, it, in, in, in a lot of cases and a lot of provisions, don't contemplate what you're, what you're describing as the, 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 you know, the long-term reality, which is why when it's feasible, getting into discussions with your bank, with your lender, with your, you know, with your customers, with your suppliers, to try to anticipate this is going to be, it's going to be difficult, but it, it, it's, you know, that's what a prudent business is going to do to try to anticipate how, if there's a second spike, a third spike, or a spike that never goes away, how they're going to be able, or if they should be able, to continue doing business with, with each other. Yeah. I mean, you'll see that with respect to the material adverse effect clauses. So typically, you know, right now at the start of this, you've could, you might have said, I didn't have a material adverse effect because one, it's a surprise, and I don't know how long it's gonna go on, and maybe it's not a big dollar amount yet, but the longer this goes out, all of a sudden you are going to have material declines in sales and EBITDA, those kinds of things. And now as it starts to extend out, this it, it, it starts to become something that's it's not a surprise anymore. We know the world has changed. You're expected to sort of evolve and become better adapted to it. And it's in some of these things now, typically with a material adverse effect, the question becomes, well, didn't really qualify because, you know, or qualified because it was outside of my control. Well, that might have been true at the start, but as we go on, all of a sudden now you can change your behavior and they're going to start looking to you to say this somewhat is in your control. So that gets it back to Rick's point of you really do need to talk to your other contract parties and your bankers to say, 
sort of what is it that I think is going to happen going forward? And that comes back to you ought to be thinking and projecting what your operations might be. I mean, you might have the assumption is we'll just go back to normal, but the real answer may be, no, I'm going to expect a 20% decline for the next year and a half. What does that mean? Uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, uh, would like to throw kind of a, a, a something from left field. Uh, let's talk about uh, tenant uh, and landlord uh, situations. We're obviously seeing a lot of uh, tenants who are uh, unable uh, to pay their full rent. We're seeing landlords not able to meet their financial obligations because their tenants can't meet. Uh, their financial obligations. What kind of counsel are you giving uh, to both tenants and landlords uh, in this really unusual time? Well, maybe uh, yeah, I'll start with that and, and give you the typical lawyer answer. It depends who we're advising, <laughs> the tenant or the landlord. But um, but but it, it is yeah. There's a lot of tenants out there asking for relief. And um, I know there's a lot of landlords that, you know, that want to work with their tenants. And, and here's what a landlord is thinking about, okay? Maybe I'll deal with it that way. Number one is my tenant, a, a, if I don't give that tenant relief or abatement or deferral, is that going to drive that tenant into, into Chapter 11 or Chapter 7? And, and combine that with um, the fact of, yeah, there's, a, there's you know, forgiveness of, of, of rent versus deferral of rent. But the other issue is that, you know, and it's fair. I mean, the, the PPP loan program does allow uh, for you to use, you know, up to 25% of the proceeds to pay rent. And so, you know, if, if your tenant has gotten a PPP loan, or let's say if they haven't applied for a PPP loan, and now they're saying, and they're eligible for it, um, and they qualify for it, and and now they're asking for an abatement. You might want to ask, well, why? Well, you could have gotten the money, and that was one of the reasons I think Congress enacted the PPP was to avoid exactly the issues you're uh, try to avoid or mitigate some of the issues you're bringing up. And on the other hand, um, you know, if the business is is uh, uh, not eligible for it, then then you have a different story. But I would also then advised to look at things like business interruption insurance uh, for landlords. Um, same kind of same kind of uh, uh, considerations we talked about earlier. Brad, anything you want to add uh, to that? I would say again, what it's going to come down to our discussions because it's really it, it's all about the cash flow. So your tenants coming up short, which means the landlord's going to be short to pay its um, loan. Landlords should be talking to the tenant. They can figure out what it might be. They should be talking to the bank too, because at one level, you know, the bank's is interested in having the landlord being able to pay something towards its loan as the landlord is. I mean, given where we're at, I'm not certain that, the, that you know, just immediately that a bank is going to want to take possession of the property because now they're the landlord and they've got the same issue. So I think if you can keep everybody informed and educated and we can make some good decisions, you can find a way to work your way through it which is probably better than just, again, you want to avoid surprises. That's when people get most irritated and when they're just saying, I have no choice, so I'm going to bring the hammer down. And, and, we, talked about, and we, we, we talked about that PPP program, but I also wanted to just underscore what Brad mentioned earlier. That Main Street lending program, I think, is, is of, of prime significance. You, even if you got a PPP loan, you're eligible for it. And, and that's something I think uh, both lenders and, and companies are, are going to take a really uh, uh, keen interest in it, should. Uh, I know we're, uh, we're at uh, 1.45 right now, uh, so that is our allotted time. And we know you all have busy schedules, and you've been very generous in donating your time uh, to us. Uh, I'll uh, allow uh, uh, Brad, uh, Richard, why don't you both uh, make some closing comments about um, the kind of summarizing uh, where we are and what, uh, what companies need to know. Go ahead, Richard. Uh yeah, let me just close by sort of just uh, repeating what, what we've – reiterating what we've said, and that is uh, what you have said earlier on, Sandy. You're absolutely right. We're in uncharted territory. I know that cliche has been used a lot, but this truly is going to change uh, a lot of uh, how we, we think about contracts, how we enter into contractual relationships. Litigation is going to just skyrocket. 
and you want to be on the side that isn't in court all the time, but is taking these steps in advance proactively to try to deal with these issues. And, you know, uh, what we would recommend is, is again, you know, dealing with the issues, first of all, understanding all these issues up front. And it's going to take a little bit of homework to do that. And then secondly, having anticipated those issues to try to deal with them in an amicable way to the extent you can. Thank you, Richard. Brad? Yeah, that's really it. It's, it's really going to come down to communication. I mean, because, uh, and, and it sounds kind of trite, it, it, in one sense, we're all in this together. And that means in terms of, well, I may be having an issue, both my vendors below me, my customers above me, they're having issues too. So let, let's, let's have the discussion. How can we work it through so that we can all keep um, functioning at an appropriate level and not cutting somebody off. Because if there is a potential solution, I think you'll find some willingness to work with it. Because starting over, particularly in this scenario, is going to be even more difficult than working through the hassles and difficulties of what we're experiencing right now. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, to our audience, uh, I just want to say, I see that uh, two questions came in at the very last minute. I'm sorry we didn't uh, get to those. Uh, uh, I will share them uh, with, with Brad and Richard just so they know what they were. Uh, Brad, Richard, uh, thank you uh, so very much. Thank you to the Miller Canfield team. You guys have been just great supporters of the chamber uh, for you know, decades now, and we just so appreciate the ongoing partnership. And thank you for sharing uh, your valuable time and advice uh, with the chamber and with our audience today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Everyone, uh, thank you for joining us uh, yet again. We really appreciate it. Uh, please uh, visit the chamber's website, DetroitChamber.com, uh, for future either teletown halls or Michigan Restart uh, seminars. Uh, and with that, I'm going to wish everyone a good day and safe health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Take care.